oops, we um, continue uh, with our next talk at 11 o'clock uh, by Sheldon Axler from San Francisco State University, who is gonna be talking on the Beerzen transform on the Bergman space. Thank you very much, Bill. So let's see here. There we go. Well, um, I'm going to talk about the Bears and Transform, as Bill said. Um, this is a great tool. And the theme of this talk is a tool that you can use. There's, there's not time for me to tell you everything about the Bears and Transform, but I'll just use some examples to show how it's a really useful tool for the Bergman space. So just to quickly set our notation, which is almost the same as what Stefan was using, D denotes the open unit disk in the complex plane. And the only difference in notation is I'll let DA denote normalized area measure. So usual two-dimensional Lebesgue measure uh, on the open unit disk, but divided by pi so that the measure of the whole disk is one. Uh, I'm only gonna be interested in the Bergman space L2 sub A until the end when we talk about L1 sub A. L2 sub A, the Bergman space is the analytic functions on the open unit disk that are square integrable. With the usual inner product, we, the inner product of two functions is we integrate the first function times the complex conjugate of the second function, and that gives us a, a Hilbert space. As Stefan mentioned, for each point in the open unit disk, the point of evaluation map is a <clears throat> bounded linear functional. Um, because we're on a Hilbert space, that means it's given by inner product with something, and we call that, that something k sub z. So let me say here, when I was practicing this talk, I tried to say k sub z instead because this talk is hosted in Canada, but I realized there was no way I would stay consistent. So z is equal to z, uh, please interchange those two. Um, k sub z is called the reproducing kernel and we have in red here the formula, the same formula you saw from Stefan's slide. And then at the bottom, is the, this is the integral formula, says that taking the inner product with that, which of course complex conjugates the uh, k sub z, uh, that really does reproduce the value. Okay, so I just repeated here the, the, um, the bears and transform, uh, the, the reproducing kernel um, formula. And we're gonna be interested in the normalized reproducing kernel. So the normalization is simply divide the reproducing kernel by its uh, L2 norm to produce um, a function of norm one. And that's called the normalized reproducing kernel. And we can find the norm of the reproducing kernel, the L2 norm, that's down here. Of course, that's the inner product of K sub Z with itself. Um, but uh, this K sub Z is the reproducing kernel. So it just gives us the value of K sub Z at Z. And if we go over to the formula here, replace the W with the Z, we get a one over one minus Z squared for the, the norm. Um, and that says the normalized reproducing kernel will dividing by that. So we get the one minus mod Z squared uh, in the numerator. And now we're ready to define the bearers and transform. So the context is we have a bounded linear operator from the Bergman space to itself. The Bers and transform is a complex valued function defined on the open unit disk. Its value at any point z, denote that by s tilde of z. We take s, hit it, take s applied to the normalized reproducing kernel and then inner product that with the normalized reproducing kernel. Now let's note that um, the Bers and transform at z, there's the definition of it. I've slapped absolute values on. Now just use Cauchy-Schwartz, we get this inequality. And now k sub z is the normalized reproducing kernel, so it has norm one. So this thing is less than or equal to the norm of s for all z. In other words, this, this bears and transform s tilde, it's a bounded function on the open unit disk. Let's look at some simple properties of it. The top there, I have the definition. The Bers and transform is S applied to the normalized reproducing kernel, inner product with the normalized reproducing kernel. Um, we just saw the first bullet point. We saw the proof that um, it's a bounded function. It's actually a nice function. It's a real analytic function. If you think of two real variables, Z is equal to X plus IY. 
um, that's that's fairly easy to show because we have a very explicit formula for k sub z. Um, it does the right thing with adjoints. The Berzin transform of an adjoint is the complex conjugate of the Berzin transform. Just put an S star up here to find the Berzin transform of the adjoint. The S star will flip to the other sides in S and then reverse the order of integration gives you the complex conjugate. The map that takes uh, an operator S to its bearers and transform is linear. That's, that's obvious. Um, it's injective. That's not so obvious, but it's not hard to prove either. So this is an injective uh, linear map. It takes operators to functions, functions on the open unit disk. And because it's injective in some sense, some philosophical sense as tilde contains all the information about S. And so the key question in dealing with bears and transform, is this useful? What properties of the operator S can be deduced from the properties of the function, uh, the bears and transform of S? So an example of that is that, that uh, S is a self-adjoint operator if and only if the bears and transform is a real valued function. So there's a nice, nice simple example. Okay. Um, I want to next show because we're going to deal, be dealing with compact operators. So I want to make the claim that the bearers and transform, the nor, sorry, the, the uh, normalized reproducing kernels, those are the case of Z's, go weakly to zero in the Bergman space as Z goes out to the boundary. Uh, going weakly to zero means if you, you inner product with any fixed vector, um, you have a limit zero as Z goes out to the boundary. And actually, this uh, because k sub z is a reproducing kernel with a factor one minus mod z squared. This is something that Stefan proved as one of the estimates in his talk. So I think I'll skip that. Uh, I'll be giving the slides later. If you want to look, my proof here is based on the fact that the, the uh, bounded functions are dense in the Bergman space. But anyway, the normalized reproducing kernels have limit zero as we go out to the boundary. So let's remember that because the key point here is that compact operators send sequences or sequences indexed by things going out to zero, the boundary, send sequences converging weakly to zero to sequences converging to zero in norm. You can even take that as the, the definition of, of a compact operator on a Hilbert space if you want. So that says that if we have a bounded operator on the Bergman space and the Burrs and transform goes to zero as you go out to the boundary, uh, if the operator is compact, then the bearers and transform goes to zero as you go out to the boundary. And here's the proof. Uh, there's the definition of the bearers and transform. Uh, hit this with Cauchy Schwartz. And because S is compact and the case of Z's go weakly to zero, the norm of the S case of Z's, because S is compact, goes in norm to zero. And there's the proof. So again, um, this is reflecting a property of the operator S, in this case, the property that it might be compact with the property that the, the boundary value go to zero as you go out to the boundary. And there's an obvious question here uh, that one wants to ask, is the converse true? In other words, if you have a bounded operator that has the property that the bearers and transform goes to zero as you go out to the boundary, then is the operator compact? the first question you want to ask about this? And the answer is no, it's not true. So here's an example to show it's not true. Um, we can define an operator S from the Bergman space to itself. Um, uh, S of a function F will be F evaluated at minus Z. So just flip it around. Um, this is very definitely not a compact operator. In fact, it's a unitary operator. It preserves norms. But as, a, as an example to get used to computing with the bearers and transform, let's compute the bearers and transform of this operator S. So the definition is we, we apply S to the normalized reproducing kernel inner product with the normalized reproducing kernel. But here I put the unnormalized one in. The unnormalized one is lowercase k. The normalized reproducing kernel is uppercase. So because I'm using the unnormalized, I have to put the norm and it comes out twice because I've got two k sub z's, so we have that. And now this k sub z is the reproducing kernel. So this inner product is just s k sub z evaluated at z. Here's the formula down here for the reproducing kernel k sub z. 
So when we add, when we replace w with z, we get um, one minus the absolute value of z squared squared. So there's our there's in transform. Now what happens is we go out to the boundary um, as z goes up to one. This thing clearly has limit zero. So here we have an example of an operator that has limit zero, but the um, but the bearers and but the operator itself is not compact. So this converse is not true. This is a one-way thing. But part of the theme is if you sort of have nice operators closely tied to function theory, there's a good shot that the converse will be true if you restrict your attention to those operators. So we're going to be looking at tuplets operators on the Bergman space because L2 of the disk, I'll leave out the measure here. It's always uh, the normalized area measure. Um, that's a Hilbert space. The Bergman space is a closed subspace of it. So we've got an orthogonal projection from L2 onto the Bergman space. We'll call that P, um, just a step and um, We have a formula for this projection. Um, if we take any L2 function, PU will be a, a Bergman space function. We can evaluate it at Z. We do that by inner product and with the reproducing kernel. Uh, we can flip the P to the other side. It's a self-adjoint, so it stays as P. Uh, K sub Z, that's the reproducing kernel. It's in the, the Bergman space. So P of K sub Z is K sub Z, so we get this. And now this is the inner product on L2. And that means we take the first function times the complex conjugate of the second function and integrate. So there we have the integral formula for the projection. Um, let me say here, um, because many of you are familiar with tuplets operators, perhaps on the Hardy space, uh, on the unit circle, uh, if you try to write the projection on the Hardy space uh, and stay just stay with on the unit circle, it, it's a singular integral. And here we have an, a genuine integral. It's not a singular integral in any, any sense. Everything converges here nicely. Um, and in some sense, that makes some properties uh, of dealing with Bergman spaces easier. There's a, another huge factor that makes properties much harder uh, in dealing with this projection. If we're working with the Hardy space, uh, as Stefan mentioned, the L2 of the circle is um, the Hardy space uh, plus the complex conjugates of Hardy space functions. And that's not true in the Bergman space. And so that makes things much harder in many cases. So the tuplets operator is defined by as follows. We take a function f, just a bounded measurable function on the open unit disk. We define the tuplets operator with symbol f. It's going to be an operator on the Bergman space. So we multiply, we take a Bergman function h, we multiply f by h. Well, f is not necessarily analytic. So this is no longer an analytic function. It certainly is a squared integrable function. So it makes sense to apply p to it. And we get a bounded operator. Multiplication by f on the, uh, has norm at most the L infinity norm of f. The projection has norm 1. So we see that the norm of the tuplets operator with symbol f is at most the L infinity norm of f. And let's compute the bearers and transform of this tuplets operator. So remember the bearers and transform of any operator is we apply the operator to the normalized reproducing kernel, then inner product with the normalized reproducing kernel. So in the second line, I've just put in the definition of the tuplets operator. Um, and then we flip the P to the other side. It stays as P, P of K sub Z is K sub Z. Now we have an inner product in L2, F is not necessarily analytic, but th this inner product is given by, we take the first function times the complex conjugate of the second function, and we have an explicit formula for K sub Z. So there's the formula for the bearers in transform of the tuplets operator with symbol F. Notice we've gone from a function F in L infinity to the bearers in transform of T sub F, which is a function on the disk. So now we extend our definition of bearers in transform. We had defined the bearers in transform of a uh, operator. Now we're going to define the bearers and transform of a function, bounded measurable function on the unit disk. So if f is a bounded measurable function, we define the bearers and transform of f 
um, to be the Berzin transform of the tuplets operator with symbol f. And so if you take the, the two red things, in other words, the Berzin transform of the function f is given by this formula right here. So this is an is this map takes functions, bounded measurable functions on the unit disk to, to another bounded measurable function, f tilde. But f tilde is a much nicer function. For example, it's a, a real analytic, particular C infinity function, uh, whereas f is not necessarily. So I've just repeated at the top here the, um, the formula for the, the Berzin transform of a function. Um, if in particular I take f to be one, well, we know the tuplets operator with symbol one is the identity operator. The Berzin transform of the identity operator is the constant function one. So we get this equation right here. And this is also a special case of one of the equations that, that Stefan had in his talk. But what this says, if you compare this integral being one and this formula for the Berzin transform of a function is we're taking f and we're um, integrating it against a probability measure, a probability measure given by this times this. And so we can think of, of uh, the Berzin transform f tilde of z as a weighted average of the values of uh, f. And where's the weight having most of its, of its mass? Well, let's see, when, when z gets close to the boundary, this term is getting, this term here is getting close to zero. But down here, when uh, z is getting close to w, we could be, we're gonna get close to dividing by zero down here. So we see most of the, of the weight, most of the mass of this measure is uh, near the boundary, takes place near the boundary. Um, so, so think of f of z, f tilde of z as a weighted average, of the values of f of w with most of the weight, um, it should be say near w. No, near z, that's right, f tilde of z we're looking at. So that's correct. So in particular, if f happens to be continuous on the closed disk, when we're starting with functions on the open disk, so being continuous on the closed disk means extends to a continuous function on the closed disk. If f is a continuous function on the closed disk, then its Berzin transform is also extends to be continuous on the closed disk and their boundary values agree. Again, that's because as we go out toward the boundary, uh, it's a weighted average and most of the weight is near the point where we're at. And so if F extends to be continuous to the closed disk, we have this property. So you should think of the bearers and transform, it's a sort of a smoothing. It's a smoothing of what of our original function, but it's much nicer because it's real analytic. Um, F, even if it's continuous, need not be uh, have partial derivatives. So one difference we see with, with Hardy spaces is the following, that on the Hardy space, the only compact tuplets operator is the one where the symbol is identically zero or zero almost everywhere. But that's not true um, on, on the Bergman space. And if we look at symbols that extend to be continuous on the closed disk, uh, Coburn showed that the, the following are equivalent, that um, the operator, the tuplets operator is compact. That's equivalent to uh, F vanishing on the boundary. And that's equivalent um, by this statement down here to the Berzin transform vanishing on the boundary. So there's a very nice, nice characterization of compact tuplets operators with continuous symbol. Um, and we can ask, and we'll ask, what happens when, when F it does not extend to be continuous to the closed disk? It's just a bounded measurable function, perhaps, on the open unit disk. So again, here is the formula for the bearers and transform of a function. Um, and let's introduce some notation, standard notation. Um, H infinity will denote the set of bounded analytic functions on the open unit disk. Um, if F is a bounded analytic function and H is in the Bergman space, then the tuplets operator with symbol F applied to H, remember that's the projection of F times H, but if F, is analytic, then so is f times h, so there's no need for the projection. So it's just the multiplication operator. If we start with the bounded analytic function, t sub f is the multiplication operator. And let's compute the, um, 
the Berezin symbol of the function f. So we have the Berezin symbol of f, by definition is the Berezin symbol of the tuplets operator with symbol f. Again, here I'm hitting this with uh, unnormalized reproducing kernels, so I have to put the norm twice out here. T sub f applied to k sub z. Remember f is analytic here, so it's just f times z, no projection is needed. And now this k sub z is a reproducing kernel, so this just gives us f of z times k sub z of z. Um, oops. Um, k sub z um, at z is exactly one over this factor out here. And so we're just like with f of z. So what this formula tells us is that if uh, f is a bounded analytic function, then the Berzin transform of f is f. So that's really nice. And then because the Berzin transform is a nice linear operator, everything happens, uh, we, we could just take real parts and we see that the real part of each bounded analytic function equals this Berzin transform. And that leads to the theorem if u is a bounded harmonic function on the open unit disk, then the Berezin transform of u is equal to u. Um, you have to be a little careful there. Uh, bounded harmonic function, uh, we know that every harmonic, say real valued harmonic function, is the real part of some analytic function. But if you have a bounded harmonic function, it may not be the real part of a bounded analytic function. Um, because the, when you take the, the harmonic conjugate, that could be unbounded. But there's an easy approximation that, that allows us to go from, um, uh, from the case where, where it is bounded to those where it isn't. So we get this, this theorem that if u is a bounded harmonic function, uh, then it's equal to its Berezin transform. But not too surprising, harmonic functions have the mean value property. Berezin transform is sort of an averaging thing. And that asks for the question, that raises the question of, is the converse true? If we take a, um, um, a measurable function, bounded measurable function on the disk, that's equal to its harmonic, it's equal to its Berezin transform, um, is U harmonic? Um, this was uh, an open question for a few years. Um, um, I certainly thought it was true. I think everyone who was working on it thought it was true. And English, Marislav English, proved that it is indeed true. That if, so here's his theorem, that if u is a, a bounded measurable function on the disk, then being harmonic is equivalent to equaling your bearers and transform. Okay, um, I'm not gonna give the definitions, but you could ask whether the same result is valid on the unit ball of Cn. Obviously there's a Bergman space there with respect to volume measure, the reproducing kernels, you can define the, the Berezin transform in exactly the same way. I should mention the Berezin transform can be defined on any reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And uh, I believe in September, we're gonna have a whole course on reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces that Javid will be giving. So I assume the Berezin transform may come up again. But the question is, is, it, is, is English's theorem uh, valid on the unit ball in CN? Now here, you, if you start thinking about that, you quickly realize that the right question is what's called M harmonic rather than harmonic. Uh, let me just say that an, uh, when N is one, the M harmonic functions are exactly equal to the class of harmonic functions. The M here stands for Mobius. So what you need to do when, when N is bigger than one is, compo is uh, compose with, um, uh, and holomorphic automorphisms of the unit ball and see what, and then before you take the Laplacian. Um, and that's clearly the right thing to do. It doesn't matter when n is one, you get exactly the same thing. But the question was, um, if you have uh, a function on the unit ball in Cn, if its bearers and transform is equal to itself, is it m harmonic? The other direction is, is easily true, as I said. And then a shocking paper appeared that says the answer to that. This is due to Hearn, Flores, and Rudin. It says the English result above with harmonic replaced by M harmonic holds on the unit ball of Cn if and only if N is less than or equal to 11. So it's true in C11 and false in C12. I, I, this is a very unusual type theorem. I don't think we see a lot of theorems like this in analysis. 
Okay, <clears throat> um, back to tuplets operators. So remember that we define a tuplets operator um, by multiplication followed by projection. Um, we have an integral formula for it because um, this is the formula for, for the projection of f times h, the integral formula for the projection of f times h. And we have the bears and transform of f is the bears and transform of the tuplets operator with symbol f. And here's the formula for that. So that's just all review of what we've covered. And this theorem shows, I think, the usefulness of the bears and transform. So I'm going to concentrate on this and some of its consequences for a little while. Um, this theorem is due to, um, to De Chao Zhang and me. And it says that if S is a finite sum of finite products of tuplets operators, then the following are equivalent. Uh, one, S is compact. Two, the bears and transform of S goes to zero as you go out to the boundary. And three, S applied to the normalized reproducing kernels goes to zero as you go out for the boundary. Um, we were interested only in the equivalence of one and two, but we picked up three as, as a bonus. So it's nice that it's there. Um, just to put this in context, if S is any operator, so forget about the hypothesis for a second that it's a finite sum of finite products of tuplets operators. If S is any operator, then um, one implies three. I discussed that earlier. That's because k sub z goes weakly to zero as you go out to the boundary. Three implies two. That is the um, just the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Um, however, it is not true for arbitrary operators that uh, two implies one is false and two implies three is false. And we saw an example with that operator, SF of z is f of minus z. Um, that operator satisfies two, but it satisfies neither one nor three. Um, it's, it's not compact because it's unitary and the unitariness also means that three fails. Um, let me also say, although it's harder to find an example, that for arbitrary operators, um, it is not true that three implies one. Okay, but if S is a finite sum of finite products of tuplets operators, we have this really nice result that you can determine everything in terms of whether or not S is compact by simply looking at the bears and transform of S. In particular, a single tuplets operator is an example of a finite sum of finite products of tuplets operators. And this result was unknown even in that special case. Um, um, there were, even in the special case of a single tuplets operator, in which case uh, S tilde becomes just F tilde. Uh, so this statement becomes uh, the two implies one, which is the hard part of this, uh, is that the Berzin transform of F goes to zero as you go out to the boundary. That should have an absolute value of Z there. So that's a typo. Absolute value of Z goes to one, then applies F as compact. Previously known versions of this, there were three of them, uh, due to Kei Zhu, Boris Kornblum, and Carl Strothoff. You can see those special cases, um, but this gave a, a proof that, that includes all of those. Okay, so I want to discuss Honkel operators now as another example of using the bears and transform. We call that P is the orthogonal projection of L2 onto the Bergman space. So I minus P is the orthogonal projection onto the orthogonal complement which is much more complicated than in the Hardy space situation. The Hankel operator is defined with symbol G, is defined by multiply by G and then project onto the orthogonal complement. Um, it's um, easy to see that if G is in H infinity, then uh, G times H is in, in the Bergman space. So the, the orthogonal projection onto the orthogonal complement is zero. So if G is an H infinity, then H sub G is the Hankel operator is the zero operator and the converse is easy to show also. Uh, we have an integral form for the, um, for the Hankel operators. Um, I think I'll skip over that and let you figure out why that's true. And the question arises is for which G is um, H sub G compact? Now notice that we cannot take the Berzin transform of a Hankel operator because the Berzin transform is only defined 
for operators from the Bergman space to itself. But we can do the usual thing. If we multiply the Honkel operator by its adjoint, that gets us back to an operator from the Bergman space to itself. And so we can, and an operator is compact if and only if the adjoint times the operator is compact. So we can use the Berzin transform after all. And this kind of product that appears, Honkel operators interact very nicely with tuplets operators. In fact, this is one of the motivations for, for interest in tuplets operators is this very nice equation right here, which is easy to verify. So if we want to see whether a Honkel operator with symbol G is compact, we can, only, we can test this. And therefore, we can just see whether it's Berzin transform uh, is zero. And here's the nice theorem. Now, this was known previously to the thing I gave you. And this was not done with the Berzin transform. But I just want to show you how using the Berzin transform can make things easier. Um, this is a classification of the, um, the bounded analytic functions whose Honkel operator, the complex conjugate, gives you a compact operator. And it's this beautiful condition that 1 minus mod z squared times f prime of z should be 0. Um, in particular, um, if f is in the Dirichlet space, well, that says that f that, that Tom talked about the, the first week. That says that f prime is in the Bergman space. Functions in the Bergman space satisfy this kind of thing. So if we take f to be in the Dirichlet space, then h of f prime is a compact operator. Um, there is a difference with the Dirichlet space here. As Tom mentioned, the only inner functions in the Dirichlet space are the finite Blaschke products. But this is a little surprising the first time you see it. There exists Blaschke products with infinitely many zeros so that this condition is satisfied. So in other words, there exists Blaschke products with infinitely many zeros whose Honkel operator of the adjoint of, of the, of the uh, complex conjugate gives us a compact operator. So let's, let's see how we, we get the bears and transform into this. So I'll prove one direction of this using uh, the results we've discussed. Um, that the Honkel operator being compact is equivalent to the adjoint of the Honkel operator times the Honkel operator compact. This is an operator from the Bergman space to itself. And it is a uh, finite sum of finite product of tuplets operators by this right down here. That's a finite sum of finite product of tuplets operators. So we can apply the theorem that, um, that being uh, compact is equivalent to having the Berzin transform go to zero. So we get this. OK, now we just apply the definition of Berzin transform. That's this line. Um, now let's write out what that means. Um, the Honkel operator, um, oh, I guess this compared to this is the norm squared, right? When we flip this over to the other side, we get the Honkel operator f bar applied to case of z norm squared, but we're talking about going to zero, so the square doesn't matter there. So we get this. Honkel operator of symbol f bar applied to case of z is the identity, which is this, minus the projection applied to that. We have this. Um, and then uh, it's an easy thing to check that the projection applied to the complex conjugate of an analytic function times a reproducing kernel gives us the complex conjugate of f evaluated at the point z. We have this. Um, and now uh, we can factor out the case of z. Norm just involves absolute values, so the complex conjugate doesn't matter. So I went through that a little fast, but it's just a standard, very standard thing using the Berzin transform that um, h sub f is uh, h sub f bar is compact if and only if we have this condition down at the bottom. So let's remember that because we're trying to get to this theorem and there's no derivative in sight. So where does this, where's this derivative gonna come from? So here's where it comes from. Let's take an arbitrary function in the Bergman space. So it's got power series representation, summation a n z to the n, n goes from zero to infinity. Look at um, g minus g sub zero, the constant term. And so then the sum goes from one to infinity. And we're looking at the square of the Bergman norm. And we know how to do that. We square the, the Taylor coefficients, and we divide the nth one by n plus 1. 
But now the sum only goes from n equal to one to infinity because we subtract the g of zero. Well, that's certainly bigger than if we just take when n is equal to one, when we get this term. And of course, a one is the derivative at zero. And let's move the two to the other side, take square roots. We get this inequality here. G prime of zero is less than the square root of two times the norm of G minus G of zero. Okay, and now we have these um, analytic automorphisms of the disk. Um, Stefan defined these. Um, it's easy to check that the, um, what the derivative of this is and uh, let's see, the, take the absolute value. There should not be a square there. That's a typo. Um, I put a square there because when we do a, a change of, of, of uh, variable in, in an integral, we'll, we'll have to do, take the square. So this side should be squared then too. Okay, so from the previous slide, we'd shown that HF is uh, compact. HF bar is compact if and only if we had this condition. And um, now let's, um, let's look at F composed with one of these analytic automorphisms and evaluate the derivative at zero. By the chain rule, we have this. Phi, phi sub z zero prime at zero has absolute value one minus z squared. Uh, phi sub z of zero is z. So we get this formula right here. And now use this thing with g replaced by f composed phi sub z. So this g prime at zero becomes this thing. That's the left side here. That's less than or equal to square root of two times uh, g minus g sub zero, but g is f composed phi sub z. So we have this. Again, phi sub z of zero is zero. Why that's why that's why, that's why this is f of z. And this is just doing the change of variable. And this is the quantity on the previous slide that we showed that if the operator is compact, this thing goes to zero. So we conclude that if F is an H infinity and the Honkel operator with symbol F bar is compact, then this thing goes to zero. And the proof in the other direction is about the same degree of difficulty. Again, if you use the Bears and transform, which the original proof of the theorem um, characterizing the uh, compact Honkel operators with conjugate analytic symbol did not do. Okay, so this quantity one minus mod z squared times f prime of z came up. Um, it's useful to make that into a, a, a space. It's called the block space. It's a set of analytic functions f on the open unit disk, such that one minus mod z squared times f prime of z is a bounded function on the open disk. And the little block space is a set of things such that that quantity has limit zero. So that's exactly the things that we saw that have um, compact conjugate analytic um, Honkel operator. Uh, this thing isn't quite a norm because constant functions go to z have zero for this quantity. So if we add, say, the value of f is zero, that takes care of that problem. Uh, that's called the block norm then that makes the block space into a Banach space and B0 um, is a closed subspace of it. We can extend our, our definition of Honkel operator. We were requiring the symbol to be bounded, but let me relax that a little bit and look at symbols that are just square integrable, not necessarily analytic, but square integrable on the open unit disk. And we'll make them densely defined operators by restricting the domain to H infinity. So now we're multiplying g, there's the L2 function, by a bounded function. That keeps those in L2, so one minus the projection makes sense. And we're thinking here of H infinity with the Bergman space norm, so it's a dense subspace of the Bergman space. So this is a densely defined operator. Um, it may or may not be a bounded operator. And um, a slight modification of the argument that I gave shows that the Honkel operator with symbol f bar, your f is a function in the Bergman space, an analytic function, square integrable. Hf bar is bounded if and only if f is in the Bergman space, and the Honkel operator is compact if and only if uh, f is in the little block space. I think I said that wrong a second ago. H of f bar is bounded if and only if f is in the block space. So, um, 
uh, Stomatis in his uh, talk last week um, pointed out that the Mobius invariant space generated by H2 is BMOA. Um, we're going to have a whole week later in, in this uh, program on BMOA. Um, but I want to just point out now that the Mobius invariant space generated by L2 sub A is the block space. In other words, if we look at uh, analytic functions f such that f compose the, these analytic automorphisms minus the value at, at the point involved, and you look at the, the Bergman norm, if those are uniformly bounded, that is exactly equivalent to being in the block space. So you should think of the block space as very much a substitute um, for H infinity. There are things where you would like H infinity, but it's not true, but the block space is the right thing, just as if you're working on the unit circle, uh, the substitute for H infinity is BMOA. Okay. Oh, one more thing. Uh, Tom in his talk mentioned that if you look at Mobius invariant spaces, again, those are things that you can compose with the, the analytic automorphisms. So you want the norm to not change. Um, if you look at Mobius in various Hilbert spaces, there's only one, namely the Dirichlet space. Um, so that's uh, one end of the spectrum. The other end is the block space. There's this nice theorem due to Rubel and Timoney that says that the block space is the largest Banach space that's Mobius invariant. So it contains all the Mobius invariant Banach spaces on the open unit disk. It's a very natural thing. Now I want to discuss duality. And um, in his talk uh, an hour ago, Stefan gave duality for the Bergman space LP sub A, where P was strictly between one and infinity. Um, but I want to discuss now the dual, dual of the L1 Bergman space. And it turns out that it's the block space. Very nice scene there, that the dual, so here's the theorem is due to Koifman, Rockberg, and Weiss, maybe known earlier, I'm not sure. This is the earliest I could find it. Um, the dual of the Bergman L1 space is the block space, meaning we, we can identify, well, there's a natural identification. Let me tell you what it is. So if we take a function f in the block space, um, it defines a bounded linear functional on the Bergman L1 space. Here's what it is. You take your function h in the Bergman L1 space. You integrate f against, uh, you integrate h against f of z bar. f is your function in the block space. And you do that integral on the disk of radius r, and you take the limit as r goes to 1. So this gives you a, so the part of this theorem is that this is a bounded linear functional. Now, I want to make a couple comments about this. Um, first, um, in his pairing, uh, Stefan had the, z, the complex conjugate outside. He had f of z, the whole thing complex conjugate. Um, that does give you an identification, but it's not a linear identification. Um, it, it has the advantage that it's, it's, it gives you back the, when p is 2, it gives you back the, the standard inner product. But I like linear identification, so I'm putting the bar inside. Um, the second thing is, why are we just integrating on the circle of radius, a uh, disk of radius r, and then taking the limit as r goes to 1? Well, f is in the block space. And the problem is that there are functions in the block space that are not bounded. For example, the analytic function, the logarithm of 1 minus z, that's a function in the block space, and it's an unbounded function on the disk. And that means there are functions in the Bergman L1 space that you can multiply log of 1 minus z by, and you get something that's not in L1. Not, the integral doesn't make sense over the disk. So I've seen some papers that make an error and, and eliminate this r. And that's, that's actually incorrect, because this product uh, might not be an integrable function. OK, so that's why we need to take the limit. So that gives us, if we take a function in the block space, that gives us a, a, a bounded linear functional. And we're saying that every bounded linear functional comes from that. In other words, if we have a bounded linear functional on the Bergman L1 space, there's a unique function in the block space that induces it. And furthermore, um, that's the dual of L1 is the block space. The pre-dual of L1 is a little block space. So things really work out quite nicely here. Um, let me give an indication of how you might 
might why why this why you suspect this is true, and uh, one of the tools that Kaufman, Rockberg, and Weiss used to prove it. Recall that P is the orthogonal projection of L2 onto the Bergman space. And contained in L2, we have the continuous the functions that extend continuously to the closed disk. And that's contained in the, the bounded measurable functions. And that's contained in the square integrable functions. So P makes sense on the biggest of these. So it makes sense to apply P to each of those. And something really nice happens. If you apply P just to the, the L infinity functions, you get exactly the block functions. And if you apply P to the functions that are continuous, up to the boundary, you get the little block functions. And now you can see how you get this theorem. So let's do the hard part of it is this furthermore. If we have a bounded linear functional, how do we get a function in the block space that gives the pairing? Well, we've got this, this bounded linear functional on the Bergman L1 space, L1a. Use the hahn banach theorem to extend it to a bounded linear functional on all of L1, L1 of the disk. It's the hahn banach theorem. Now we know what bounded linear functionals on L1 are. They're given by integration against L infinity functions. So now we've got an L infinity function, of course, just measurable. We want to end up with an analytic function. How do we get an analytic function out of an arbitrary L infinity function? We project it. And when we project it, we get exactly a function in the block space. So this red inequality right here is really equivalent uh, with a little bit of work to this duality. So get this really nice duality. Okay, since we've been talking about block, I want to conclude with a little bit of history here. Um, there's something called Bloch's theorem. It says if you have an analytic function on the open unit disk, let's call it f, suppose f of zero is zero. To normalize, suppose uh, f prime at zero is one. Bloch's theorem says that the image includes a, a disk. Oh, well, f prime at zero is one. So f is, is one to one near zero. But Bloch's theorem says something quite stronger. It says there's a, a disk of, of, of radius c. There's some constant c. Uh, there's a disk of radius c that is in the image as a one-to-one -one image of some part of the disk. Um, and furthermore, the c is, is independent of f. It doesn't depend upon anything. Same c works for all x. Um, this is called Bloch's theorem. It's, it's an open question as to what the, the, the best value of C is, uh, still unknown. And this is what Littlewood wrote about Bloch's theorem. He wrote Bloch's theorem, uh, one of the queerest things in mathematics, and one might judge that only a madman could do it. He was aiming at an elementary proof of Picard's theorem, an impotently damn fool idea. With this as a start, it is just a reasonable stroke of insight to conjecture Bloch's theorem. The result, once conjectured and being true, the proof was, of course, bound to emerge sooner or later. But to keep up the era of farce to the end, the proof itself is crazy. So notice the words madman in the third line here of, Blanc, of uh, Littlewood's quote and crazy at the end. And I don't think that Littlewood knew this because it was not widely known. Um, but Bloch spent his entire adult life uh, in a uh, psychiatric hospital. It's an interesting history here. And he, and he did all his mathematics there. Um, Bloch was a, a French. Um, at the beginning of World War I in 1914, he was drafted in, into the French army. He was a, a university student, undergraduate at the time. Um, in 1917, he was home. Um, and having dinner with his family, and he something snapped, um, almost certainly due to experiences in the war. And he murdered uh, his brother, his uncle, and his aunt. Um, and fortunately, Bloch was not executed, but he was sent to a psychiatric hospital for criminals. And he spent the rest of his life there. And that's where he did all his mathematics. Um, this was a, a fairly good facility. He was able to receive math papers and math books. Um, he published 66 papers during his lifetime, um, all of them written in this psychiatric hospital. Um, he never went to a math conference. Um, he never taught a math class. Um, on his papers, he just listed the, the street address of the psychiatric hospital as, as um, his, his address, no institution given. He apparently was a, a, was a model patient. There was no more 
never any incident of violence. So very strange thing, but some very good theorems. So that is a good point to stop. Um, I'm going to um, try to put this file before I close. Let me see if I can put this file uh, into the I'm going to, I'll do that in a second. Um, first, I've got references here and I wanna thank uh, this, the, the organizers. They put a tremendous amount of work into organizing this, this um, meeting. And I wanna thank them so much. They did a terrific job and I wanna thank the audience. Okay, with that, I will see if there are questions. Please put them in the, the uh, close in the chat box, and I will. While you're thinking of questions, I will try to put the file uh, there. And I see Jonathan Partington put a reference uh, to a history of block uh, in there. Let me again try to do this file. So while he's doing that, if anybody wants to put anything in the uh... Uh, chat and uh, it's also if, if you have a question there are 105 of you so just uh, I, I can't keep track of any raised hands or anything like that so just shout it up sh shout it out like a big noisy Thanksgiving um, file is coming very soon so Javad uh, is going to raise his hand like I explicitly told him not to do but uh, you see me. Uh, Sheldon, it's about uh, Kaufman Weiss uh, theorem, uh, the, the bijection between uh, uh, functionals and, and function in the block space. Uh, what is the connection between the norm of the functional and the norm of the function in the block space? What is the connection? Oh, they're equivalent. So the, the um, let me go back, see if I can go back here. You're talking about this theorem here that I'm showing yeah. now. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yes. So, so further, furthermore, yes. So the the um, the the block norm and under this pairing, the block norm of f is equivalent to the norm as a linear functional. Okay. They're they're not equal though. They're not equal. Yeah. Thank you. They are equivalent. All right. Any other? Uh questions or comments in the, I'm keeping an eye on the chat and the file is there now in the chat and I'm keeping an eye on all of you. So uh, anybody have any questions they want to ask and well, I have a quick uh, question. Sh Sheldon, do they uh, are uh, are there any other sort of uh, classes of operators where people have worked on the beers and transform? Um, um, other than Hunkel and Tuplitz operators. Right. Right. Um, that, that is where there's the most closest connection. One can also try composition operators. Uh, it doesn't work quite as well. It's, it's, it's not quite as close a connection. Um, but that would be the next probably thing to look at. Okay. Uh, there's a comment in the uh, chat um, uh, from Joe Sima. Can you give me an idea as to what functions the integral in the Koifman, uh, Rockberg, and Weiss do not hold, but the limit exists? Yeah, so if you, again, if you take f to be a log of one minus z, uh, that's an unbounded function. And so um, it can't multiply the Bergman L1 space into itself, because if it did by the closed graph theorem. Okay, I, it, it can't multiply the uh, the log function log one minus z can't multiply the L1 space into itself because um, to do so by the closed graph theorem would be a bounded operator. It's easy to see that it isn't. 
Um, so I don't have an explicit example, but that's an existence proof that um, you really do need to take that limit. If, if you're going to talk about that integral as a, as a Lebesgue integral, meaning that when you slap absolute values on it, the integral has to be finite. Uh, Sheldon, there's also a, a comment from Javad about the block uh, constant. Ah, you think it's known by now. I don't think so, but I could easily have missed that. There are always, I, I, I all, sometimes see papers saying, here's a slightly better estimate. It's, no, it, it, uh, it's, it's not known, but as far as I remember, Paul Gauthier has something on it, the best known approximation by now. Ah, best known, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I, I think that's not the best because it's an interval. It's a sm very small interval, but it's an interval that he, he places it in. Okay. Okay, so let's thank uh, Sheldon uh, one more time and just give us a little break before the next uh, talk. So thank you very much. Thank you.